to see you all. My name is Patria Burchard, and uh, what a lot of people ask me, what happened? Where, where did you go? Did you, why did you disappear? Um, and I didn't, but um, I only did one anime, which is Tenshi Mundo. Since then, I've been acting, voice acting, etc., uh, or it's just called voiceover. I think we do commercials. I do a lot of commercials. But I've also been writing. Um, I have published one novel called Camelot and Vine. I didn't bring any because I didn't, uh, first of all, I didn't think that I could carry them. Because <laughs> a lot of books, it's heavy. But I have bookmarks if you want them. It's uh, uh, one of those books that's available on Amazon, but I think your bookstore can also order it if you want to get it that way. And we'll just, I'll just put these here for later. And I have a second book called Act As If, which is uh, about what it's like to be an actor in Hollywood who's not a big star, but somebody like me who, you know, goes to auditions and uh, meets casting directors and you know, big famous stars don't have to meet casting directors. Uh, people cast movies around them. But that's what that book is about. And I wrote, I started writing um, with Act As If in about 2004. I had an idea for a humor poem that was part of a, an actor's website. They have a little newsletter, not little, it has about 100,000 readers. They send out this newsletter to their readers and I thought, I think it'd be really fun to just share some ideas and commentary on what it's like. Just, you know, bombing across the parking lot in your high heels and trying to look like a, I don't know, doctor, businesswoman, whatever they want you to be, and carry your script and your headshots and all that stuff, and arriving at the audition perhaps sweaty and not prepared, and whatever other things happen in real life. So that's what that book is about. And there is one chapter about Ryoko, and that's the chapter about when the producer made me sing which was not a happy occasion for any of us. Um, but today we're going to talk about writing. And I want to show you a little video that I think is really exemplary of story structure. And I think every story needs a structure. And this is Biscuit, the Sleepwalking Dog. Maybe it's not. Yes. I 
from fall to fall. The first leg of that bridge, and he calls it the bridge of disbelief because you suspend your disbelief when you read a story. So the first leg of that pole is Act One, basically. It's when we meet the character, we find out uh, who she is and what her problem is, and in some cases, especially in a movie, they'll use something called the inciting incident, something that sets the story in motion. Alice falls down the hole, the rabbit hole, you know. Uh, or I don't know if you're all familiar with The Wizard of Oz. I can use that one in the States. Everybody's seen it. But uh, Dorothy gets uh, whipped up by a tornado and dropped into Oz. Um, Harry Potter gets discovers you know that he's the child of. Uh, <laughs> you got something to say? Do you want to say something? Because um, when you said Harry Potter. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yes. Harry finds out that he's a, not a muggle, and he's got to go to school, and he's got to go. And that starts the story, it's that moment when the story starts. But before that starts, we see his situation a little bit. We see where he lives with these awful people, this awful aunt and uncle and cousin. And uh, we have that set up. But we can't stay there. That's just to give us an idea of who he is and where he comes from. Then he goes off on his adventure, and that's what the audience pays you for. They want to see what the adventure is. So they want to see this girl or woman in her gang and the mistakes she makes and the danger she gets in and they want to see that. We want to see Harry go through all these trials of, you know, these frightening teachers and uh, scary enemies and three-headed dogs and whatever else Harry can conjure up. Um, that's what we pay for. And then at the climax, your character either wins or loses. They, you don't have to give us a happy ending. You do have to give us an ending. Anybody here ever read a story that was part of a series where they sort of drop you off? Yeah? Do you want to make a comment about it? Percy Jackson. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But did you continue to read the series? Oh, yeah. Why? Because um, you want to find out what actually happens to them. Okay. You want you want to find out like at one point they get dropped into Tartarus, um, which is like hell, and you want to know if they'll actually find a way out again. Which... So why do you want to know? Why do you care? Because you care about the character. You it like it the about the connection with the character. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. that's what makes you curious and dig in deeper of the story and try to find out. Are they going to survive? But because now we we feel connected with them, mm -hmm. and it's part of yourself now. That's a good answer. That's very true. <laughs> and at the end of Harry Potter, for example, um, the first book, just the first book, you could read that book and not continue on with the rest of the series because you get a beginning, middle, and end. You know this series is going to go on, but Rowling doesn't just drop you, you know, and say, okay, uh, you have to read the second book to uh, find out if Harry's going to get out of this one. She gets him out of that one, but we know that there's more school coming in the next semester, so we know that the story goes on. Um, I've read stories where they were part of a series and they want you to read the whole series, and they, but they don't give you an ending in the first story. And that makes me mad. <laughs> I just, you know, I'm not reading your second story. I'm sorry. I, that really makes me mad. You need to give me a beginning, a middle, and an end. As simple as that. Yeah, because the waiting for the next story is almost, yeah, it's almost torturous because they usually give, put them out like a year apart. And then mm -hmm. you've got to wait a year for the next episode. It's just. Because you're desperate to find out what's going to happen to the characters that you've put your emotion into, yeah. and yeah, it's almost torture. Well, those must be pretty good characters, then. Yeah. Unless yeah. it's the Game of Thrones books in which place you're waiting about five years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've waited about six years since Dungeons & Dragons finished, and I want to know what's happening next. Yeah.
Well, TV shows all well and good, but it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, and Martin uh, writes long books. So um, I have a feeling that he wants to put a little more time into it, you know, but maybe uh, five years is. is oh, I'd love to. There are some novels that are written that way. There are novels that are written in stories. So you could read just one chapter and that'd be a satisfying story. But it's part of the rest of the whole. And, um, and it's satisfying because you get some closure. Maybe not just one issue, but you get some closure. And I think that's something that a writer needs to provide for their readers. And obviously, as you so uh, clearly stated, we must care deeply about the character. That's not just, uh, that's not going to be just somebody who, maybe, let's say it's a hero, a guy. And he's strong and he's handsome and he's uh, generous and he's kind. Who cares? We need to know what his faults are his fears, uh, what makes him like us, because, you know, we're all imperfect. So, um, give him three dimensions, make him a person. That's, that's the most interesting thing, I think. Superman has his kryptonite, right? And, uh, and the woman that he loves, and he, he has weaknesses. Otherwise, he'd be so boring. <laughs> Um, who else has a story that they're working on? Yes. Okay. I've got to look at the other side of the room next. Come on down. Come on down. Okay. Okay. Tell us a little bit about it. My story is pretty much... Um, my story is almost finished. It just needs some um, editing and some... I've been working on a children's story. Um, when my child was very little, she refused to go to sleep. So I kind of made up this story to encourage her as to why sleep was important. Um, so, so I'm trying to now write it down in a better way so that other people might want to hear it too. Um, and I have it on my pad. Um, but basically, what's going on is um, we're in Santa's workshop and there's a bunch of elves and they're trying to make things and, and get ready for Christmas. Um, and there's a very, very sleepy elf. And any task they ask him to do, he basically falls asleep during it and messes it up. So, and the very last one he does is he's been asked to clean the sleigh because water and everything, he can't, he can't possibly go wrong with that. And he falls asleep on top of the sleigh and falls through it and kind of breaks it up a bit. So, and it's not really his fault, so what um, happens is they exile him from, um, from the workshop and, and they get really fed up with him and they decide, yeah, we don't need you around anymore. Um, so then what happens is everything's all ready and done properly and um, Santa's ready to do his deliveries. And Santa tries to deliver things to the, the kids' houses every house he goes to, the kids are all awake and he can't deliver any of his presents and he can't figure out why um, until he gets to one house and all the children are fast asleep and so are all the parents and everybody and he can deliver as normal to that house. Um, and then he figures out, he sees that the sleepy elf has made that his new home so he's asleep under the kids' beds. Um, and that way all the kids are asleep and he finally finds a use for the sleepy elf. He takes him in the sleigh for all of his deliveries and it spreads the sleep around. And finally in the workshop they find out why sleep is important and why the sleepy elf is made and why 
even though when he falls asleep he messes up other stuff that needs to get done, he still needs to be around and you still need to have sleep and you still need to get the right amount of sleep. So basically that's my story. <laughs> So what are you waiting for? Are you sending it to publishers? Sounds like it's ready to go. I haven't got any artwork. Oh, no, no, they'll get it for you. Oh, will they? I think so. I if it's done that. the same here yeah, yeah. as it is. If you want to read it properly, then that's, that's <laughs> it all written out. Okay. But, yeah, well, I, don't know how, I don't know how to proceed to get it. That's the next thing we yeah. need to talk about. So go ahead and have a seat, and okay. uh, we'll talk about that, too. Because when you are ready to publish, there are some, so many options these days. First of all, you can publish it yourself. If you want to do that, that's what everyone keeps telling me to do. But it's not the I only way to do it. Just, I, I can't draw to save my life. So. <laughs> well, there's a whole con here full of artists. <laughs> so you can probably find somebody. But uh, that's one way um, to publish it yourself. I will tell you, though, for self publishing, artwork is kind of a tough thing uh, because the, a lot of the digital platforms don't do artwork as well. From what I understand, I haven't included it with my stories, but um, if you use photography or drawings, it takes a little more complicated production. And whereas a, a regular just print book can be churned out whenever create space or anybody else wants to churn it out. So you can do print on demand, but you may not be able to do it so easily with a book that has artwork. Um, However, publishers, from what I understand in the United States, and I don't write for children, but they, um, they'll match the artwork for your book. Okay. So you don't have to do that yourself. If they like the story, they'll find the right artwork. In fact, I don't know if you're familiar with a book called The Day the Crayons Quit. Yes. This was huge in the States, a huge kid's book. And uh, the guy who wrote it is an acquaintance of uh, me and my husband. And we don't know him really well, but we've met him a couple of times, and we went to one of his readings, and we went because he's a filmmaker, and my husband's a filmmaker. But um, Drew didn't draw any of the pictures. He used to tell the story to his kids, and then he wrote it down, and then he gave it to his agent. His agent sat on it for something like six years, and then called him one day and said, we have a deal. And he sold it. The publisher, he didn't meet the artist until after the book was published. And uh, it sold so well, and it was so popular that it was made into an animated film. And Universal Pictures hired Drew and his partner to write the next story. So they're going to do another movie. So uh, you never know. I mean, this, this, he thought this was, I mean, 60 years, come on. You're doing, you just kind of moved on from that. So um, that's what I know about children's books. The, the other thing is I have no, zero confidence whatsoever, so even getting up just now and telling you that story, I'm still shaky. I thought um, you were from <laughs> And um, so, I told, obviously I told it to my daughter, and she really liked it and actually made her go to sleep. But I have no <laughs> idea if, it's, if that's going to have the that effect Well, you need to children. do some research, and that's uh, part of the job. It's a job, publishing, writing, if you want to publish, like to eventually. It's, it's more than just writing. It's like acting is more than just acting, voice acting is more than just acting. You have to study the business, find out, research the publishers that you're interested, find out how they take submissions. Do they need it, an agent submission? They might want you to have an agent. Some of them don't want to deal directly with writers at all. Um, some of them are happy to take your submission and look it over themselves. Uh, if you want to publish it yourself, then you need to research how that's done. It's, and believe me, this is so much easier than it used to be. It's everything you want to know is on the internet. Just go to your favorite search engine, type in your question, and your answer comes up. And you used to have to go to the library for this stuff. <laughs> so this is much easier. Uh, let's see, who else has a story idea? Yes. Oh, you know what? I'm, no, go ahead. I, that wasn't okay. fair. I was going to say I should get a guy because I've been. It's fine. You can just. <laughs> you sure? Come on. That was a little. I can project. Okay. Um, I have an obstructive main character. Um, <laughs> again, this is a story that has uh, 
been in progress for about a decade. <laughs> uh, it's very beloved, and the characters are very beloved to me. It generally gets written when I'm going through a hard time, so sometimes it can get quite dark. It's fantasy. Um, but my main character uh, calls this my story to Saul. <laughs> he, he, is, he is lethargic, he is lazy, he is not a likable character, but I love him. And everyone will love him <laughs> and hate him simultaneously. But he stalls everything. I have to bring in characters That's to get him moving. Yeah, <laughs> living characters. That's what I need to. <laughs> he, you know, they, they, I, I've had to bring in, there's, there's six now supporting characters who shove the story forward, but have you got any tips for yes. altering a character that well, he what stays within himself, but you kind of... I, I don't know if that's even necessary, really. Um, although I think a character does need to go through some kind of change in the story. They have to learn something or achieve something. They have to, there has to be a story arc for your character. Um, otherwise, he's just going through the motions and it's, that's plot. And every story needs one, or most stories need a plot. But you also need a story, which is really what, uh, where the wisdom is in, in the characters, the relationships, what happens to them, how they change. That's the story. You don't go to see Iron Man, because you want to see uh, the guy fly. We've all seen him fly. We want to see what happens to him and how he reacts to it. We want to see him go through some trials and tribulations. So um, having a character who is who's hard to like in the beginning, my main character in Camelot and Vine, she, some people said, oh, I almost didn't continue with this because I didn't really like her. But she, she changes. Um, she has to learn why her cynicism and tough exterior are not getting her anywhere. But I have a suggestion for you specifically. You might try writing when you're not going through a dark time, when you're feeling good. See if that helps. And also, if you really want to be a writer, write regularly. This is the best tip I could ever give. Even if it's only 15 minutes, do it every day at the same time, and if you can, in the same place. Just sit down, write for that amount of time, and believe me, that's how books get written. You just have to do it every day. Otherwise, if you wait for inspiration, I mean, that can take forever. Uh, you're not going to be inspired for weeks, and you'll never get a story done. But if you sit down with that character, and that character's problems in life on a regular basis, even on your good days, uh, the story will, I guarantee you, it'll move forward. Thanks for asking. Um, I should take a guy question. It's been all women. I know you have a question. I'm saving you. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, you're not a guy. <laughs> I can't tell all these wigs and everything. It's unfair. I have seen so many very pretty women, and then I went, oh. <laughs> but, you know, it's like being in LA. <laughs> so, please go ahead. Um, I've got a story that's um, like it's magical realism sort of mm -hmm. stuff. I've got a lot of stuff figured out about like the main characters and everything, um, but part of my issue is finding antagonists and villains and that that work, that are compelling, that are interesting without making them too sympathetic and yeah. not worth fighting. I think um, an antagonist is, as is every other character and everything else in your story, they're all a function of the main character. So whatever your main character needs, that's what your antagonist is in the way of. So that's their barrier. That's what an antagonist is. Um, so that might help you figure out. And also, if your main character, for example, is a woman who wants romance, well, maybe she meets a guy, and he's a jerk. 
you know, or something like that. Uh, seems like the right thing, and then he turns out to be the wrong thing. An antagonist um, doesn't always have to appear to be an antagonist. And sometimes you find out in the end who the bad guy is, you know. And they've been stymieing things all along, um, but you don't always know why. But in the end, and I think in the best stories, it's always a function of the main character. Yes? You got a question? Yes, um, when I'm doing my story writing, it's like I'm I've been doing it, trying to do it for about a couple of years now, but every single time I'm like up to like 30 to 50 pages, so most of the time I keep um, refreshing the whole script thing because I'm just not entirely happy with the way I start out the story and just go through it. I try to pace myself into certain sections and I'm trying to make it so I'm not like doing too much or too little mm -hmm. of certain scenes. And in paragraph writing, it's just like constant. I, I just don't know exactly how to like make it to a way that I can actually be happy with it. Are you starting over again? Over I mean, I've been doing it for like two, three years. Um, and you're starting it. You're so keeping I've got about that 50 or so pages in both uh -huh. sides. just like, just, just constantly keep going on with it. I've got my story, my plot and everything. Yeah. But just to try and to structure a sentence structure in the best, best way without making it so I'm like, oh, too much okay. or go too little. Okay. Write the whole thing. Make it suck. Write shit. Write <laughs> crap. I am serious. Get that crap out on the page. That's where your gold is because that gives you something to edit. But until you get that junk, out onto the page, you don't really have anywhere to go. That's why you do a second draft, third draft, fourth draft, etc. That's why you edit. Uh, but on your first draft, don't edit yourself, don't stop yourself, don't get in your way. Just write the crap. And that's literally, if you search that phrase online, write the crap. You'll find it all over the place, on the writer websites, on the chat rooms, in the publishing websites. Write crap, uh, because I really, that is the way to get past that. Uh, oh gosh, I know a writer who's the best writer I have ever read. She writes blog posts, so I'm not going to give you her name, she would be ashamed. She writes the most <laughs> wonderful blog posts. They are brilliant. She can't get a book out of herself, because she can't let herself write one crappy sentence. And so she can't get farther than about a thousand words with a story. So I encourage you to just don't make it perfect. Just throw it there. Yeah, just get your story down. You know what your story is, you said, right? So write that out, write down, beginning. And then here's what happens in the beginning. Then write middle. And here's all the things that happen in the middle. And then write end. Here's all the things that happen in the end. And then within those things, in the beginning, middle, and end of the beginning, then you can further your outline. You know, and you can do that with the middle and the end as well. And that may help you get it out onto the page. Um, but yeah, please do write, write some crap. <laughs> so I'm very passionate about that. Um, Jack, you've got a question. Yeah, uh, well, really, it's two in one. Because it's trying to find the time to actually write it. Because I work, it's like I do load models all the time. So, like, for example, I got myself a laptop on my lunch break, I could write something, but then I hardly had any lunch break, it would be all the time and everything. And, but then I'm also thinking of it whilst I'm working. And when I get home to try and write it down, I'm trying to think of so much at once, I can't get any of it on the page. Yeah. Um, because I'm thinking, well, this aspect of this, this aspect of this, and I want to hurry up and get this down before I forget this, and you can't just like figure out what to put that. Have you got some, um, <laughs> <laughs> have you got some uh, uh, audio software that you could just talk into? Maybe just, I have on my phone, if I, I could just text myself a message, just press the little microphone. Oh, and then I'll uh, dictate it. Just so. dictate, yeah. You know what? I have too far about that. I actually tried to write notes instead, but that actually sounds good. You can get a live spread thing. So it's like, it's, um, I got it in college. It's a little pen that um, you get the special paper, and as you write notes, it records as you're writing. Oh, yeah, I see. Those. And then you just, you, you literally like dab the play button on the paper, and it'll play. So you can like, oh, double click on a note with a pen, 
and it'll start playing the audio that you were that it heard as that note was being written. Oh. And you can get them W. H. Smith. They used to be expensive, but they're not that bad. But they're really handy because I have a really terrible memory. <laughs> <laughs> so because I, I I don't do like novel writing, I do like music. So sometimes I would hum something, and then it would be really helpful. So yeah, that's cool. Nice yeah. Idea, really handy. Um, yeah, really. You could use that for a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, I used to know a writer who had one of those, and I, I had seen it, but that's been a while since I've seen it. So, glad to know that's still out there. <laughs> Another thing you can do, uh, like I said, try to just get yourself 15 minutes every day, and that's your 15 minutes, or 20 minutes, or an hour, which is better. Um, usually, what I do, I'm fortunate because I'm freelancing now, so I can kind of choose my hours. Uh, I just get up earlier than my husband does. And so that hour before he gets up is my writing time. I feed the dog, I make the coffee, coffee I sit down and write until he gets up. And I hope he sleeps late because that gives me more time. You know? <laughs> but um, you find your time, something that you can have every day. If it means getting up a little bit earlier, that might be worth it to you. Right? It sounds like you're working pretty hard and you're pretty tired at the end of the day. But um, if you can just give yourself a few minutes, and they are your minutes, and nobody else has access to you, I think your loved ones, if they really love you, will understand that you need those minutes. And that's how stories get written, just by that regular time. And also, I did write a TV pilot on my lunch hour years ago. Never went anywhere, it wasn't any good, but at least I learned to do that. You know, I had to put in time at lunch. And I had an hour lunch every day, supposedly, but it was really about half an hour. Yeah. Did you have a question? No? I thought I saw a hand go up. Yes? It's a, what if you have too many ideas? So if you want to write one story, you just want to keep adding, adding, adding to it. Do they all go in that story? Do no, they all go in there? Which ones do you choose to put in and which ones do you sort of choose to put out? Hmm, that's a, that's a good one. You know, I think, I know some writers keep what they call a story morgue, which is basically a, just a file of different stories. And each story um, has its own folder. And then you just throw notes in there. Every time you have an idea for that story, you put it in there. And when you have enough ideas for one story, then you sit down and you write it. You sound like you have too many ideas just for one story. Is that correct? Um, well, just choosing certain ideas to add to that. Mm -hmm. like, so I'm trying to create like a bit of a story. Oh, okay. Like, something like a whole thing. Yeah. Like still brilliant. Yeah, okay. Well, that's a pretty big job. Mm -hmm. I would suggest you take each one of your ideas and develop it separately and then see how they mesh together. Try reading something like, um, I think it's called Winesburg, Ohio. Or there's a book by Elizabeth Strout called, that she won the Pulitzer for. Mm, what's that one called? Does anybody remember? It's a series of stories. And the thing that strings them all together is that they all take place in the same area. And they all make some kind of reference to the same character. And that's what the book is, is named after her. Oh, shit, I can't think of it. Um, but if you have all these ideas and they're all strung together by one, like you said, this mythos, um, can you write them as separate stories? Can you do that? Yeah. Yeah. I, Start that Again, it's just the which ones to choose and like, which ones to leave out. Leave out the ones that aren't any good. And choose the ones that are good. <laughs> which, one is, which one is the one that's just grabbing your heart? That's the one you start with. Get that one ready. And, uh, and then go to the next. Yeah. Or at least get down the notes. Get down your outline, beginning, middle, end. Okay? All right. Oh, we, do, we have enough time to continue. 20 minutes. Oh, yay! <laughs> I'm going to have some water. I do tend to talk too much. Why don't you talk for a while? <laughs> I was actually wondering, um, I've had a story for a while that I've been trying to do, 
but it's high fantasy and the thing that I'm absolutely terrified of is making a high fantasy that will then just be another Game of Thrones or um, Lord of the Rings. Is there, is there any kind of way to not make it into the same sort of thing? Well, you could do worse than uh, Lord of the Rings or uh, any oh, of those, no, but, but yeah, you, you want to write your own story. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's just like how, how, because what I've got at the minute is um, there are these different races that don't like each other and are going, going to war. So I've got the characters, got the plot. You mean? I'm, I'm absolutely terrified. Yeah. That, you know, it basically sounds like something like Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones because it's, it's kind of the same concept. But what do those stories have? What do those stories have that makes you compelled to watch? It's not because there are these warring factions, it's because there are these characters that you need to know about. I mean, I'm, I have not watched an, or read Game of Thrones, so I can't speak to that, but Lord of the Rings, oh my gosh. You've got Bilbo and Frodo and Aragorn and all these fantastic characters that you must follow. You must know what's happening to these guys, right? And uh, that's what the story is about. The story is not about the orcs or about the war or about the ring even. It's about Bilbo and Frodo. And, and I forget which one is the one who's in the Lord of the Rings and the one who's in the Hobbit. But, uh, Bilbo is in the Hobbit. Bilbo's in the Hobbit. Okay, so it's mo that's about Frodo and Samwise and. And their relationship, which is the central relationship. Um, and the journey. Have you... So they're yeah. <laughs> this, uh, in fact, Lord of the Rings is a good example of one kind of story, which is the hero's journey. Mm. Uh, if you're familiar with Joseph Campbell. If you're not, check it out. Joseph Campbell uh, looked at mythology from ancient times to now and gave us a kind of an outline that we can all use. George Lucas used it in Star Wars to the letter. Joseph Campbell's outline actually, um, you think you're writing the same story that everybody else wrote, but when you got that hero, you're not. You're writing your story even if you use the hero's journey. And the hero's journey is basically uh, a guy who has a quest, or a woman who has a quest, and first uh, she sets off on that quest, and let's see, then there's danger and horror and awful things happen, and she finds a, a wise person, Gandalf, uh, or uh, Yoda, who helps her along, and yet she is the one who has to uh, learn that wisdom to use to basically complete the quest. Get the ring, or um, kill your father, or become a Jedi, or whatever you have to do, and come home. But you come home changed. You're not the same, you know, Luke Skywalker leaves as a boy and comes home as a man. And uh, that's, you know, that's what happens to Frodo. He, he's, uh, he loses so much, but he becomes himself. That's a great story. Uh, so if you haven't read Joseph Campbell, and it's called The Hero's Journey, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It's really useful for outlining a story. And also, if you haven't ever taken a writing class, take one. You know, uh, some people may not think that things like grammar and punctuation are important. And they're really not on the first draft. Forget about it. Just write it. Just write it. But when you're putting your story together, uh, grammar, punctuation, spelling, all that stuff helps your reader to follow the story more easily. So that's useful. And in a writing class, you may or may not get that. It depends on the class you want. You can get a class about um, working just on your hero. You can get a class about story structure. You can get a class about grammar plot, anything. So if that's what you want to do, I highly recommend you educate yourself.
because the really educated writers are the ones who I think are the ones. It's, it's like watching soccer or cricket. I mean, we don't play cricket in the States. So I have no idea what it's like to watch cricket. But it's like watching great athletes do something. They had to learn how to do it, right? They didn't start out that way. I always think about Michael Jordan playing basketball. Um, he was he just, it was like watching a fantastic ballet. He had to learn how to do that. And then, when he learns all the rules, he can just toss them aside and play. And that's what a great athlete does, that's what a great writer does. You've got to learn the rules, and then you just toss them aside and you write. Uh, so I do recommend educating yourself. Yes? I work as a teacher, and my job is to get them getting grumpy teenagers to write. Uh. I do a lot, yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I try to be a writer myself as well, but a lot of my job involves getting them to write. I use a lot of different writing exercises and all sorts of things, but do you do any writing exercises when you're kind of thinking, what am I going to write next? Do you recommend any, any particular? What I use for myself is something called free writing, which isn't necessarily directly about the story. But I might uh, write, I, I might be having a bad day and just write about that, but I try not to censor myself. Or maybe say, saying try is not the word. I don't censor myself. I just write what comes out, and it might be blither, 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 blither. This is stupid. Well, I shouldn't have written that. And this pen is not working. And I just keep writing until something starts to come out. And it always does, inevitably, especially if I insist that I must write for at least 10 minutes. I can't stop. I can't take the pen off the page, I have to keep writing. That's one good one. But you can also have them, I, I would try having them write about the character. Maybe something, maybe a story that doesn't actually happen in the story that they're writing. Just um, what they had for breakfast that morning, what kind of things they have in their wardrobe, uh, what they don't like about their mom, you know, anything that's kind of a, at the side of the story, not really in it. And that just gets the juices flowing, I think. Then they start to know the character better and um, understand, I think, a little more about what that character needs and wants, which is what the story is about in the first place. Well, I can't wait to make their hands hurt now. That'd be great. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I don't know. If, if you tell them to write blither, 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 they might really like that. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't worked with high school kids or um, teenagers, so, so probably, like, uh, probably like the equivalent of junior high age, so like okay. 11 to 16. Okay, well they may not like it, I don't know, you know more about them than I do. <laughs> but, um, they don't like a lot of things. I know. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not cool, they don't want to do it, yeah, exactly. uh, but maybe they'll write it. Did you self-publish it? Yeah. And you, you're not happy with it? No. Okay. If, um, if the publisher pays, then the room is expensive, so the books can probably never be checked. Well, and a lot of times, in fact, you should know that if you're self-publishing, um, many stores won't carry your book. So that's just part of the deal. Uh, self Partly because if it's available on Amazon only, they won't buy it from Amazon. They just don't like Amazon. Because Amazon stole their business. So that's one thing I would suggest. If you really, really feel bad about it, you might try using a fake name, a pseudonym, and try again. But I do know that there are, uh, this, is, this comes under research, going, doing a Google search, you can um, publish for free. Amazon has, a, not, you know, Amazon isn't the only place in the world, but this is what I used. I used CreateSpace, 
and that is free. But I do recommend, get an editor. Get somebody who's a professional to read it and help you edit so that you can be the proudest you can be of it. And uh, don't feel too bad about it because there's so much stuff out there. And uh, you get to write more. You don't have to stop. You can only get good at it by practicing. Okay. Yeah. I'm writing in, in the present tense right now, too, and I'm finding it a challenge. Another challenge is writing uh, in the first person, because if you just have one point of view, then there are so many things that your character can't know. So that's another challenge. But it's great to challenge yourself. Writing is a challenge. It's just what it's going to be. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> She's, uh, I'm writing about her right now, in the present tense. Uh, her name is Wilma, and the book will be called The Wilma Dialogues, and whenever it comes out, I don't know, but uh, she's so entertaining and so um, communicative that I have to write about her, because she's always telling me stuff. So I don't know. Um, okay, yes, you had another question? Sorry, if the um, writers and artists yearbook is still relevant with... You know, I don't know too much about publishing in the UK. Um, I have a feeling that what's happening with so many other industries is happening to this industry as well, which is that it's being, becoming global. Uh, with that said, I would say that any information that you need is online and probably free. So um, there, there are magazines that are that cater to writers, like poets and artists, or is it poets and writers? Poets and writers um, is very well respected. There's uh, the Writer Magazine. There's Paris Review. Um, there is so much information that there's almost too much. I signed off to get some newsletters about uh, publishing, and I have to sign off. I'm getting email all the time. So there, there are so many outlets for your work, so many places to publish that, yes? This isn't really a question, it's more just a bit of advice for people to find out more yeah. about. Because um, I, I, I work in different libraries as well as sort of, um, oh, okay. I've lots of publications. There's lots of um, writing conventions that are popping up now. Yeah. There's, there's, uh, there's like the Young Adult Literature Convention, which I just attended. And there's a lot of advice on how to get published at them. There are workshops, you can meet authors and they can tell you how they kind of, the sort of things they have to do to get published. And there's, those are quite good to attend as well if, if you're a huge book fan like me. But there's also lots of avenues you can take and lots of guidance you can give from these places by speaking to various yeah. different authors and public. Also, the publishers attend these events too. Lots of free stuff, that's always yeah. Good. <laughs> and sometimes there's agents and editors and workshops, and depends on what you're looking for, it's out there. 
things yes. out there. There's just so much of it. That's the Young Adult Literature Convention in London. It's quite a new convention, but there's a lot of, I mean, I host, I've had a lot of authors come to my school, so they've, um, through them, they've actually gone to this event as well, and I've actually this event, so. Yeah, and I've read about other international organizations that will have a convention in England once a year, or um, the Historical Novel Society, if that's what you want to do. They, uh, are, it's mostly uh, England and America, or I should say UK and America, and um, this year it was in Oregon State, in the States, so next year it will be here somewhere. Last year I think it was, in, or two years ago it was in Oxford. So, um, I think we may actually be out of time, I'm not sure. But anyway, anything that you need, you can find online. So ask your question. Oh, we have three minutes. Yes? I actually want to make, uh, uh, from the previous question, about rewriting something mm -hmm. that, that you're not happy with. There's actually um, an author that I read called, what's his name, David, uh, how do you pronounce that? David uh, Galish, the, the day he published that kind of so, yeah. but he writes um, a series called um, A Dance of Cloaks, which is about an assassin, but he's already written the entire series, it's been republished when, because he wasn't happy with it, oh. so he's been republished as he's editing it. Interesting. That's interesting. So, so it, it's perfectly okay to do, to do that, especially yeah. if, uh, if, you, if you feel like you want to make it make it better because from what I've from what I've seen he's done a much better job than he did last time. That's interesting. That's one of the great things about digital publishing is that you can redo it. Yeah. One last question. I've written fan fiction for years and years and years and years and I'm really worried that I can't produce anything original and that if I base it too heavily on people that are already in my life because a lot of my friends would read my work and go, why, why am I in this? You know, and I'm, I'm just really worried about that. So I can't, I do a lot of character development in the fan fiction that I write. Um, there's usually gaps in time between when a series and when I finish it, and so something drastically happened to a character that I've been writing about at the moment. You know, she goes from um, being, um, she's, not the main character, but she's kind of like the girlfriend to the main character, and she ends up becoming the, the leader of the team to, to save the world, and the characters come and go, and, and so the chemistry is a lot different in the next series that comes along, and I thought it would be nice to kind of fill that gap with all sorts of bizarre things, because this character has to go from someone that is so um, swooned by the guy to actually being quite strong and almost cold, uh, and just leading an entire crew, and I'm really enjoying that. The only thing is, is that I'm going to that time in my life where I'm going, yeah, I've been writing fan fiction since I was 16 now, I'm actually turning 30 next year, and I want to be able to do something that is fresh with new characters, like mm -hmm. I'm involved with so much other things outside of anime that I would love to be able to stick in. But I just, I worry so much that it's going to be too, too close to home. So, is that okay. something that you worry about? Yeah. Uh, and maybe it is too close to home, but nobody cares to read about it if it's not. You know, what I mean? um, writing is personal. I know what you mean about not wanting to write about people you know because they see themselves, and then it might hurt feelings or something. But um, this goes back to what we were saying about challenging yourself, about trying something that you haven't tried before. Maybe if fan fiction, if you've gotten too good at it, it's time to stop writing it. If you're not too good at it, then there's no reason to stop. You know? But um, I would love to see Stephen King, for example, write something besides horror. And I, that's his best stuff. He wrote a book about writing. I've read that twice. I love that book. So um, challenge yourself by writing something different. It doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to be published. Nobody has to read it, but it's your start. Write about somebody you don't know. Make up something. Or write about yourself. <laughs> that's that's hard. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I thought I'd have like five people here, maybe ten. <laughs> I was lucky, and I'm so glad that you're all here. Um,
If you have any other questions during the con, I'm here, so you know, come up and say hi and we'll talk about it. And uh, right now I think I have to give the room to somebody else. But I so much appreciate your coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.